I want to talk to you tonight about eternity and your soul. The Bible makes it clear that there is a heaven and there is a hell. Both of these places are literal and eternal. And your destination as an eternal being will be either heaven or hell. An eternity in the presence of God or an eternity banished from the presence of God. Now God has raised a standard based on who he is, based on his person. The Bible declares that God is a holy God. One of his commands, be ye holy for I am holy. Spotless. Sinless perfection. There is no shadow of turning in God, meaning there's no darkness about his being. He doesn't just give love, he is love. He doesn't just give peace, he is peace. He doesn't just give life. He is life eternal itself. God doesn't just say what is holy. He is himself the standard of holiness. God doesn't just say what is good. He is himself the standard of goodness. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, what the scripture means here is that every single one of us have done something to break God's holy command. Every single one of us have done something to violate that holy standard. When God formed man, he formed man with a purpose. God had an intention for man, and it was man's destiny to have dominion over the earth, to be a steward of the earth, to be a caretaker of what God had created. God creates, man cultivates. God starts, man stewards. God forms, man begins to fashion what God has formed. We were given the responsibility of partnership with God, not because he needed us, but because in his grace and mercy, he chose to create us so that he might show us love and mercy and kindness and purpose. It was out of his love and goodness that he formed us. But the Bible makes it clear here that everyone has sinned. What does this mean? It means we've fallen short of God's holy standard. It means that there are things that we do and say and think and attitudes that we carry within our own hearts that violate the goodness of God, that break the law of God's justice, that turn against his very nature, that rebel against the purpose for which we were formed. Every single one of us. There is not one righteous, no, not even one, the Bible says. No one with all of their good works, no one with all of their good thoughts, no one with all of their well-wishing could meet God's holy standard if we have sinned. 1 John 1.10, the Bible says, If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people. None of these, the Bible says, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is a problem. That man has violated the standard that God has raised. Creation has rebelled against the creator. And if you're not careful, your rebellious nature can begin to fight even the idea that there's such a thing as a holy standard. People get offended at the idea that God judges. They get offended at the idea that God is a God of justice. Well, think about this. Have you ever been scrolling down the social media feed? 
looking past different posts only to stumble upon a story about a heinous crime that is committed, perhaps a murder, perhaps something even worse. And you read that story, and I promise you, as you read that story, and you begin to look at the various comments under that post, you'll begin to read people calling out for justice. Well, that was done in cold blood. Or that was done with malicious intent. Or that was done with evil in the heart. Throw the book at them, we say. Give them life in prison. Give them the death penalty. And when we see these sins, as vile as they are, projected before us on social media, everything within us cries out for something to be done against that sin. But then we demonstrate our very own hypocrisy. For when it comes to the sins of others, we cry out for justice. When it comes to our own, we cry out for mercy. And you are proving to yourself by way of your own conscience, when you cry out for justice, you are demonstrating that you agree that sin must be punished. We just don't want it to be ours. If God is a good God, why would he judge? It's because he's a good God that he judges. It's because he's a holy God that he must punish sin. And the Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Hebrews 9, 27 says, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Hell is the constant state of highest anguish, and it's a reality of scripture. One of the most loving things a preacher can do is warn the wicked of an eternity without Christ. Because even though society has changed, even though people have tried to philosophize their way out of truth, I'm here to declare to you tonight that nothing in the scripture has changed. Truth is truth. The fact of the matter is simple. The only reason that one could be offended by the existence of hell is because they're not offended enough by the idea of sin. We don't realize just how unholy it is, how vile it is. You violate that eternally holy standard of God. It requires eternal punishment. It is the goodness of God and the justice of God which responds to these things. And the Bible declares that each one of us is destined to die. Now, I know that's not popular to say, I know it's not going to gain me a large following. I know that the world won't applaud me as I say these things. No, the world is going to tell me I'm bigoted, narrow-minded, small-minded, old-fashioned, and out of touch. So be it. You're narrow-minded, David. Good. Jesus said narrow is the way. (laughs) You bet I'm narrow-minded. Some people are so open-minded their brains are falling out. Either Jesus is Lord or he isn't. Either Jesus spoke truth or he didn't. Either the Bible is the word of God or it's not. And we have to stop compromising the message in an effort to win people over. I'd rather tell you the truth that sets you free than a lie that keeps you in bondage. I'd rather offend you into heaven than comfort you into hell. And my friend, I'm standing here as a preacher who loves you, who comes to you in the name of Jesus to tell you that the Bible is clear that the wrath of God is being stored up against those who practice unrighteousness without Christ. It's eternity in hell. Period. You say, David, that's not very loving. That's not very good news. And you're right. That's not the good news part. You see, before you can present the cure... You must give the diagnosis. No one is going into surgery unless they're convinced they need it. No one is starting a new medication unless they're convinced that they're sick. No one is going to see the doctor. You can hardly get people to go to the doctor when they know they're sick. Let alone get them to go to the doctor without them being sick. 
When somebody knows there's something wrong, then they seek out the cure. And I'm telling you that that thing in your heart, that knowing that you were purposed for more, that knowing that something is just not quite right in this world, that knowing that there is this higher calling, that knowing that there is this purposeful pool on your life, that is the Holy Spirit calling you unto Christ. That is God reaching out his saving hand and trying to snatch you out of hellfire. That is God trying to get your attention. You were created with purpose. You were created to be loved by God. You were created to love God. You were not created to live in depression. You were not created to live with anxiety. You were not created to live bound by sin. You were not created to live under the power of the kingdom of darkness. You were not created to be separated from God. You were not created to be confused about who you are. When God formed you, he formed you with purpose and intention. There's more, there's so much more than you can see with the natural eye. There is a world beyond the world that we can see, and you know it in your heart. You know deep down inside that there's just something off, and you also know that there's something more. The scripture declares that he's not far from any of us, that we can reach out our hand. That he's just right there. Hold your hand in front of your face like this. He's as close to you as your hand is in front of your face. We imagine that God is a million miles away off in the distance. Turning a deaf ear. Turning a blind eye. Not wanting to have anything to do with us. That he's indifferent, arms folded, looking over the balconies of heaven, disgusted by the creation that he formed. No, my friend. Because even though there is bad news that sin must be punished and all have sinned, the good news is that God gave a free gift. Now, the plight has been clearly painted for us in scripture. I watched as a woman was being preached to on a university campus. <laughs> and she asked the preacher, do I have to be perfect to get into heaven? He said, yes. She said, are you perfect? He said, no. She said, are you going to heaven? He said, yes. And she was so confused by his answers. <laughs> because that seems to be the logical conclusion. You have to be perfect to be one with God. You have to be perfect to get into heaven. That's a fact. The Bible establishes that. And all of us have sinned, so none of us are perfect. So the question becomes, how does this work? Well, that's where the Bible tells us the good news. Because there's nothing any of us can do to save ourselves. Nothing. Look, you could stop sinning right here today. Somehow, some way, for the rest of your life. Like right now, stop. And for the rest of your life, you could go to church every night of the week. You could go to every prayer meeting, every Christian conference. You could give every time the plate comes around. You could give to the orphans and the widows. You could sell all you have. You could do all that's in your power to do and dedicate the rest of your life in service to humanity and the needs of others. You could become this great philanthropist. You could give your life to doing good in this world. And still, the Bible says, your righteousness is as filthy rags. So people get it in their heads, especially church folks, that... I have to perform in order to gain that salvation. But that's not what the scripture teaches. Because if you believe you're saved by your works, good luck. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 and 22 says this. But now God has shown us a way to be right with him. Without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Now, this is where people become confused because they say things like, well, I want to serve God. I just don't think that I could do that whole Christian thing for the rest of my life. I don't have it in me. I don't have the ability. And that's exactly right. That's why you need saving in the first place. It's like this. When I go in 
to visit a medical professional facility, if I go into a surgery center and they want to perform a life-saving surgery on me, I don't go into the hospital and say, okay, where do I wash my hands and where are my tools? I don't say, okay, give me, give me, give me, the, give me all the medical books, give me all of the research, I'm ready to perform this surgery. No, that would be, that would be rather foolish. Especially if you're an, under anesthesia, forget it. There's nothing you'll be able to do. And that's what people imagine. It's like they have to save themselves, present themselves to God, and say, okay, is that good enough? And then they're not really going to know until they get to heaven. Or before that they stand before God, and then I'll find out if I made it or not. I don't know about you, but I'm not guessing. I know when I stand before him, I'm going to hear, well done. Why, 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 why? Not because I place my faith in my perfection, but because I place my faith in his perfection. Like that person going in for surgery, it's not that I'm going to perform the surgery on myself. Rather, it's that I yield myself and place myself on the operating table and say, okay, you do your work. Jesus is the surgeon of the soul. If you're familiar with gaming consoles, this is my younger brother, Pastor Michael. He and I had a Sega Genesis in the 1990s. And I'm going to make a confession right here in front of everybody. (laughs) So remember when we used to play two-player games? You weren't actually playing. I unplugged your controller... (laughs) And the computer took over. Oh, you said you know. Good. Well, I don't feel as guilty then. I thought all these years I was holding it. I would unplug your controller and the computer would take over. The computer would take over for the character because I didn't want to, you know, you were good, but I wanted to win the game. (laughs) But then there were some times when I felt really bad. And you probably didn't know this. I would switch the controllers and I would play for you. And on his screen, he'd get all these points, not knowing I was the one who did the work. Well, when you give your life to Jesus, you're switching controllers with him. You're saying, Jesus, I, don't, I can't do this. There's no amount of good that I can do in this world to make up for the sins that I have committed. And you're carrying that burden. You're carrying the guilt. You're carrying the shame. You're carrying the regret. You're being eaten alive by the memory of your past. And you wonder if you could truly change. You wonder if you truly can become someone new. My friend, that's what it is to believe on Jesus. That's what it is to receive the free gift of salvation. When Jesus died on that cross for your sins, he literally took your place in the spiritual realm. Do you realize, my friend, that after you receive Jesus... When God looks at the cross, he sees your sin, he sees your wrongdoing, he sees your mistakes, he sees your character flaws, but when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. It's the great exchange of the cross. At the cross, Jesus, who lived a perfect and sinless life, died in your place took on the wrath of God, took on your sin and shame. And in your place now is his perfection, his accomplishments. That's what it is. It's a great exchange. He died in your place so you could live in his. And all it takes is faith. You say, wait a minute, I thought I had to do good. I thought I had to start living differently. I thought I had to start going to church. I thought I had to start changing. Yes, that is true. But please hear me now. This is one of the most important things you will hear when it comes to the salvation message. Because many people, including believers, have this mixed up. I do not do good works to be saved. I do good works because he has saved me. Your holy living, your righteous living, all of the good deeds that you do for the Lord, 
You're not doing them to try to earn your salvation. You do those things because you're thanking him for having saved you. It's done. Jesus said, it is finished, not you take it from here. He didn't intend for you to live your whole Christian life wondering, am I going to make it? Am I not? Am I going to make it? Am I not? Well, that's the religions of the world. That's how they live. They, they don't know exactly what their fate will be. It's called the blessed assurance. I know that I know that I know that inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And so we recognize these things. God is holy and just and good. And you and I have violated that holy standard of God. We've committed acts that violate his goodness. We've all sinned. And there's nothing we can do to save ourselves or to make up for what we've done. And this is where Jesus now comes and takes our place, dies in your spot so you can live in his, takes on your sin so you can take on his righteousness, takes on your, your imperfection so you can take on his perfection. And you become the righteousness of God in Christ. Christ stands in perfection. And when you walk in faith, you stand in Christ. And now you offer yourself up and you say, I can't save myself. I don't even know how to do that. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know how to find God. I don't know what I have to do. What must I do to be saved? You're born again. How? The scripture makes it clear. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And then here's the miracle of salvation. You're saying, I'm going to get onto that operating table. And he gives you a new nature. He changes your life. He transforms the way you think. And day by day, you begin to be transformed by the goodness of God. But my friend, the saving is done the moment you believe. And if you're relying on your good works to keep you saved, you have a warped view of the gospel. You know how to know if you're stuck in legalism? You know you're bound by legalism if you live in the constant fear of losing your salvation. Yes, we ought to live holy. Yes, we ought to live righteously. But we do so knowing that that's from the place of having been redeemed, not to be redeemed. Now you're in this place tonight and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you concerning salvation, eternity, life unto God. And you're in this room right now or you're watching online And you know in your heart that you've not received this free gift of salvation. Perhaps you've never taken the moment to truly repent and say, God, I turn to you now. Or perhaps you've not quite understood how it all works, thinking that it was up to you to save yourself. And you may have doubts and you may have questions and you may have even insecurities about your past, bring those to the cross. Bring your doubts to the cross. Bring your insecurities to the cross. Bring your questions to the cross. When you go in for life-saving surgery, you're not questioning the doctor about every move he'll make with his hand, about every instrument that will be applied, about every medication that they will make use of. You simply, by faith, get on that table and say, whatever you think needs to be done, do it. Well, that's what it is to surrender to Jesus. That's what it is to believe on him. You're banking on what he did. You're throwing yourself backwards into eternity. An eternal trust falls saying, I believe your sacrifice will catch me. I know I'm not good enough. I know I violated your standards. I know I'm not living right. But when I turn to you, you can save me. And he'll change your nature. He wants to cleanse you from the guilt of your past. 
He wants to liberate you from the anxieties that you carry about today. And he wants to give you a hope for a future in eternity with him. One with God, right with him. Peace with God. It's what you need. It's what you've been looking for. It's why you feel empty. It's why you feel aimless. It's why you're filling around in the darkness trying to find a purpose. Now, you may say, I don't know if I have what it takes to be a good Christian. None of us do. That's why we need him. And I promise you, he will give you the power to live right. You may say, wait a minute. I've done some things that I don't even want to mention. There are things that I feel such regret for. Things I should have done that I didn't do. Things that I shouldn't have done that I did. And I'm carrying that and I don't know. Is, is, is the blood of Jesus powerful enough to cleanse even me? I promise you. No matter how dark the sin. No matter how deep the stains. The blood of Jesus can make you whole. The blood of Jesus can wash you clean. He'll give you a new future. He'll make you a new person. He'll make you right with God. And now you're forced to make a decision. Standing before you is not a preacher. Standing before you is not just a message or a religion of the world. It's not a philosophy. Jesus himself stands before you, knocking on the door of your heart. And you can do one of two things tonight. Either you can suppress the voice of the Holy Spirit. You can ignore, you can reject what he's trying to get you to do. And you'll leave this building with the burden of sin still on your shoulders. You'll get in that car. You'll drive home. And as you're driving home, you'll sense that darkness still hovering about your mind. You'll place your head on your pillow tonight. And you'll be saying again and again, I should have responded. I should have responded. I should have responded. You come when he calls you. Because that's when the spirit is drawing you. Or you can leave here tonight. Receive the forgiveness of those sins. Have the burden and the shame the weight, the darkness, the consequence of sin lifted from off of you. Become a new creation. You'll be filled with peace and love and joy overflowing. You'll walk out of this building feeling like you're walking on a cloud. You'll get in that car driving home and you'll say, I don't know what this joy is in my heart, but something is different now. And you'll say, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I did what the Holy Spirit told me to do. I'm so glad I responded. When you finally give your heart to Jesus, your only regret will be that you didn't do it sooner. And he'll accept you. And he'll clean you up. And he'll give you a new nature. And he'll give you a new name. And he'll breathe new life in you. You just have to put your faith in him. I'm going to call upon you to do so now. And it's important to remember this. That when I call, it's not me calling. I'm just a servant. I'm just an instrument. It's the Holy Spirit drawing you. And tonight, you're not responding to me. You're responding to him. Now, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, you accept me before man, I'll accept you before my Father who is in heaven. And so tonight, I'm asking you to make this public. I'm not going to have anybody close their eyes or bow their heads. This is something public that you're doing. But this isn't an act of shame. This is an act of victory tonight. For we, the church of God, are about to witness the greatest miracle, which is salvation. And so you're in this room, you're watching online, and you know 
that you know that you know that God is calling on you. And it's time. Aren't you tired of running from him? Aren't you tired? Come to me, he said. All who are weary. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You want to receive Jesus. I'm going to ask you to do something. You say, that's me. I know it is. Don't wait to see somebody else responding. Don't wait to see if your friends or your family will be there to look at you. Don't wait to see if someone's going to join you. It's you and God now. You want to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. I want you to stand up right where you are. Remain standing if you're standing, please. If you're standing already, please remain standing. One more thing I want you to do. I want you to come here to join me for a prayer. You're standing up in your seat. I want you to walk down the aisles, come from the balconies, come from the back, come from the overflow, and just come. Come to Jesus. Church, can we give the Lord a hand of praise for these lives that are about to be transformed? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Nothing like it. Nothing like it, gentlemen. Nothing like it. God bless you, sir. God bless you. They're still coming from the balcony. I mean, if we came to Florida just for this, it was worth it. You have no idea how happy I am to see you. I look across this altar and I see young children. I see, shall we say, more experienced individuals. It's never too early, it's never too late. It's never too early, it's never too late. His hand is not so short that it cannot save. Now you who are down here, I want you to listen to me very, very carefully. This is so important because I will be judged by God if I don't communicate this properly to you as a preacher of the gospel. We teachers are judged with stricter judgment, the scripture says. So let me make this as clear as I possibly can. No one in the history of all of human history, in all of biblical history, has ever been saved by a prayer. Prayer does not save you. Only Jesus saves you. Only Jesus. So, the role of confession isn't the production of salvation. Confession unto salvation is what the scripture describes as you making a public statement of something that's actually happening in your heart. So if you're just saying the words, it means nothing. It's not a special or magic prayer where you pray it, you're good to go, you can go on living the way you want to live. No, what you're doing right now is you're surrendering to Jesus and you're saying, you are the Lord of my life now. I put my faith in what you've done on the cross. You're putting your faith in that work. And the prayer is an expression of what you're doing in your heart. So the prayer doesn't save you. So you can't say, I would say because I repeated after David Hernandez and now I'm good to go. No, you are going to actually talk to Jesus. The good news is you're going to meet him right now. 
you are actually going to meet Jesus. So you're talking to him and you're giving him your life. And you're saying, what you did on the cross, I want to, I want to partake of that. I trust what you did there. I trust what you did there. And I know that it was good enough. Faith in the finished work of the cross. Now, when my four-year-old, Aria, she's very persistent. When she wants me to hold her, she just puts her hands up like this. And she won't let me pass. She'll, I have to, you have to pick me up. So what I want you to do right now, just as an outward sign of inner surrender, I want you to close your eyes. The only reason I'm having you close your eyes is to remove distraction. Close your eyes. And then I want you to lift your hands like you're saying, pick me up. You're reaching up to him. And as we pray this prayer, I want you to say it unto God sincerely from your heart. Repeat after me, and as you repeat after me, I'm going to ask the congregation to likewise repeat after me as we join our faith with theirs. Say, dear Jesus. Say it again. Say, dear Jesus. I come to you as a sinner. I admit I've done wrong. I've sinned against you. A holy God. But now, Lord, I'm done running. I turn away from sin, from rebellion, from Satan. I turn to you now, Lord. Say, Jesus, only you can save me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you lived a sinless life. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead in bodily form. I believe you sit at God's right hand. Jesus, save me. Say it again. Say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. My God. My King. I turn to you now. And I declare by faith from this moment on, I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Let's rejoice with them. The angels of heaven are rejoicing. There's a celebration happening in the heavenly realm. As sinners are snatched from hellfire, the kingdom of darkness has lost big time tonight. And now what I want you to do is we're going to sing a simple prayer. All of us will do the same. Hands lifted, eyes closed. Steve, please, I surrender all. Every voice lifted now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior.
chapter 1 and this is what's happened tonight we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have the endurance and patience you need may you be filled with joy people of God now fellow brothers and sisters may you be filled with joy listen listen if you came here tonight and your bank account was empty you can check your bank account right now, and it'll still be empty. But even though your account may still be empty, there's joy in your heart. You may have come here tonight, and maybe you've been living a life that's destroyed your family. And you're going to walk out of this room, yeah, the, the family may still be strained, but there's hope now for the future. You, you came here tonight. There are some issues with you that you're working through and problems that you're trying to overcome and things that frustrate you about yourself. Welcome to the club. We're all still frustrated with ourselves, but now you have the grace to transform from day to day as you are conformed to the image of Jesus. And the Bible goes on to say, always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. That's you. You have a new heavenly inheritance now. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. Don't expect God to fix all your problems. Because Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulations. Yes, we believe in miracles. Yes, we believe in healing. Yes, we believe in deliverance. All of that's wonderful. But don't expect God to fix everything in your life to run perfectly so. In fact, I'll tell you what you can expect. Some persecution. You can expect some people to turn on you. You can expect some people to make fun of you and mock you. But all oh, what you've gained is so much greater. Oh, what you've gained is so much greater. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his own soul? And the Bible continues. For, and this is why we're rejoicing tonight. I'll tell you, the kingdom of darkness has lost big time tonight. Big time. For, for, he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased freedom and forgave our sins. You are now of the kingdom of light. what he's done church you are now of the kingdom of light I'll tell you this whatever the past it's done I want you to do something and, and, and only do this one more time for the rest of your life please because after today I don't even want you to go there again I want you to think of the worst thing you've ever done the thing that keeps you up at night thing that, that torments your soul. Now look at me. After what just happened now, that has been cleansed. It's under the blood. It's done. Find a solid church. Where's the pastor of this church? Is he here right now? Oh, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll find him soon. And he's, he's, I know it's a good solid church. Find a good church like this one. Find a solid church like this one. 
It, see, see, that's a good pastor right there. They said he's outside talking to people. That's how you know a good pastor right there. He said, there's some people who couldn't get in. We're going to talk with them. This is a great church. Why not this one? Or, or, or find a good church and get planted. F find a good place to call home. And get in the word every day now. Talk to God every day. It's a simple walk. It's not all going to be perfect, but it's simple from here on out. One more time, church, and I'm going to ask you to do something just a little. You might be a little shy, but we love you. It's kind of like when your family comes in and sees you, and you're like, oh, I don't know, but hey, we're your family. I want you all, if you're standing here in the front, I want you to turn around and face these people. Can we welcome our new brothers and sisters into the kingdom of God? rejoice with them. And as they go back to their seat, I'm going to read from the comment section here on YouTube. As they make their way back to their seats, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, I want you to just leave in the comment section. If you just gave your heart to Jesus, then I want you to write two simple words in the comment section. I want you to write born again, two very simple words to let us know that you prayed that. And there is a bit of a delay, so we'll start to see those in just a moment. But you know, this is why Jesus told his disciples that he had eaten food that they knew nothing of. The, the, the food he ate was to do the will of his Father. You know, you see people like this coming, and giving their hearts to Jesus. To you and I, we see a crowd. But have you ever looked at the faces to see beyond the crowd and see the people? That... In each and every individual, there is a story, there is an experience, there is something that's been transformed. These are lives that are going to be radically transformed. Can you remember when you first gave your heart to Jesus and you first felt the forgiveness of God wash over you and you sensed the lifting of that burden? That's what just happened here before us. And I pray, church, we never get used to it. And I pray, church, we get back to it. I think it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I'm by no means bashing the church. It's, it's Christ's bride. I love the church. I love the church. And I love pastors and leaders and apostles. And, and they're all wonderful gifts to God, uh, from God. But, but we have to remember that in all of our encouraging, in all of our edification, in all of our teaching and conferences and worship gatherings, those are wonderful, wonderful things. Please keep doing them. In all of those things, we cannot forget the soul. As I look here... In the comments section, a woman named Tracy writes, I am born again. Amen. And I see also the community saying welcome, 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 welcoming these wonderful people. Another comment, born again. Oxyplatinum, born again. What a, I'm reading YouTube names. Oxyplatinum, whoever you are, born again. Andrea, born again. Devin, born again. Susan, born again. Louise, born again. Born again, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. Born again, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. Church, can we give Jesus a hand of praise for these souls coming into the kingdom? Born again, born again, born again, born again. Wow. Oh, I feel like I could go home now. Don't worry, we won't. I know there are still other things. Salvation is the greatest miracle. And in a few moments, we're going to believe also for your healing and for your deliverance. And you watching online, please remember that not only are you going to receive of that salvation message that you've just heard, but now also, that same healing and delivering power which rests on this room can touch your life right where you are. There is no distance for God. You in the floor here, you in the balcony, you outside, still people outside hungry for the power of God. That's spiritual hunger. And now we know that by faith we connect. Now I will make this request of the ushers, please. Please, 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 no more going through this door in and out. I understand that during maybe regular services, that's what's used, but we're not using that tonight. 
And I, I, I so appreciate you respecting that tonight. I know sometimes if it's our home church especially, we feel a little comfortable and it's a little unusual, I know, and thank you for being gracious with us and, and working with us there. But there's a, there's a reason we do things the way we do them, so I'm going to ask that we please not go in and out of this side right here. The ushers can direct you otherwise if you need other direction. Now, I want to share with you briefly a portion of Scripture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read, and it's still coming, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. I'm going to go home and just read all these tonight, <laughs> scroll through them. And some of these are actual names, Elaine, and then Silly Willie, <laughs> Esther, Elaine again. These are wonderful, wonderful testimonies. How many can just sense the joy of the Lord on this place? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter nine. I'm going to go to verse six. The Bible says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. We're going to read verse 8 in just a moment. Look up at me. I said this at the beginning of the service before we really even begun, had begun. And I want to repeat this again. Your giving is not tied to your healing. Your giving is not tied to your deliverance. So as I take the offering tonight, I don't want any of you giving out of compulsion. I don't want any of you giving out of guilt, out of pressure, out of a gimmick that you think that's being implemented here. No, I'm just simply taking an offering for the work of the ministry, and it's quite simple. If you believe in the work of the ministry and you want to see it go forward, you give. It's that simple. I find that the people of God, generally speaking, are very generous. I'm looking at you all across this room now, and I can sense the connection online. You're generous people. You just want to know, is that going to help advance the gospel? Okay, I'm in, and I'll do everything I can. And so as I read this tonight, realize that when I talk about the harvest, when I talk about planting seeds and receiving, I'm talking about financial stewardship. I'm talking about the fact that if God sees that he can trust you with financial resources, specifically finances, then as you sow those, you begin to reap. Now, it's not like a magic charm or some ritual that we do. It's as simple as God saying, okay, I see you're generous. I see you're a good steward of the resources I gave you. And therefore, I'm going to help you to become a person who can bring in more resources so that you can continue to bless the kingdom. Simple. And I think we complicate it when we tie in all those other things. But still be encouraged to know that the Bible here is specifically talking about finances. And God does speak to our finances. Verse 8 says, and God will generously provide. Are you following along? Does it say some of what you need? And God will generously provide some of what you need. And what does it say? All. Write that in the comment section. All. Then, and this is an extreme statement. Really think about what it's saying here. Then you will always have everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. Wow. What a promise. You know, that's true prosperity. Some God will make millionaires. I, I know Christian millionaires. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. But that's not the promise of the gospel. I'll tell you what the Bible does promise. Provision. And biblical prosperity. What is biblical prosperity? It's quite simple. It's when all your needs are met and you have enough left over to bless others. Amen. Simple. And the more you walk in that stewardship and generosity, God begins to increase you. I've seen it happen over the years for our ministry. When we first began in ministry, and there was a few of these guys. We had Steve, of course. We were like, you were like six or seven when we met. And then, of course, my brother. I've known you your whole life. <laughs> and there's a few I can look around the room on our team who've been with Patrick's, been with us for several years. They saw the beginning works of the ministry and I'll tell you, I, I first began filming on what we called the mom cam because it was the camera that belonged to my mom and dad. 
And it's the kind of camera your mom would take on vacation. You know, the, 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 the big ones with the little viewfinder that came out, you put the actual tapes in it. Now everyone just has it on their phone. But then you had a bag, you had batteries, you had tapes. That's what we began ministry with. And I would do everything I could with the, to the best of my ability with that camera. And then one day, I'll never forget it, my youth pastor, he comes up to me and says, hey, I want to talk to you. He says, the Lord had blessed my wife and I with a camera. I still remember the name of the camera. It was the Sony VX2100. And it had all these lenses. And it was a, he gave it to me in a leather bag, like exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or even imagine. <laughs> right? And so he gives this to me. And it has a digital component to it to where now I can plug it into the computer. I can begin editing videos. I started making DVDs, uh, ministry products, and so forth. We just started really going for it with that one camera. Until one day, the Lord told me, I want you to sew that. And then he told me who I should give that camera to. Now, if you're from this area, Orlando, the ministry I gave it to is actually here based in Orlando. And I went to lunch with this pastor, kind man, sweet, Jesus-loving man. And I said, hey, um, God told me to give this camera to you. And I did so reluctantly. And at first, I thought it was the enemy, you know, rebuking it. No, I rebuke it, I rebuke it, I rebuke it. And then the Holy Spirit, just as gently as he ever does, no, you have to give this to him. So I placed it, I I kind of just kind of slumped it on the table. (laughs) I said, there, God told me to give that to you. Part of me was rejoicing. Part of me was a cheerful giver. So part of me was blessed, I suppose. And I remember I told him, God told me to give this to you. I don't know why, but that's what he told me to sow. And he takes it. He says, you know, we've been praying about starting on media. He hadn't been doing media yet. Today is one of the largest Christian media ministries in the world. And he hadn't started yet. And he says, this camera is confirmation that we're supposed to do that. Amen. Yeah. But now I didn't have a camera. And so I'm saying, Lord, you got to help me here. I, 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 need, I need support. I need, I need to be able to raise support to get some equipment because we're a media ministry. And the Lord touched the heart of an individual who, by his own admission, didn't even like me. He said, I didn't even like you. But God told me to give this to you. He hands me a stack of $100 bills like this thick. I thought he was like a drug dealer who got, got saved. <laughs> but he was just a fellow churchgoer. He goes, he goes, God told me to give this to you. And he sticks in my hand $14,000 cash. And he says, that should be enough to buy you. And then he liked me, but he admitted he didn't like me before. He says, that should be enough to, to get your, your ministry going to buy equipment. So we bought equipment, cameras. And I remember we started broadcasting with that, working with that. We, we were doing live streams before live streams was a thing. We had this special software. And there were some Mondays, guys, we broadcast every Monday. There were some Mondays where our viewership would skyrocket to 30 people. <laughs> That's how successful it was. But we kept at it. And, and the Lord opened the door one day where a large, it was actually the largest Christian network at the time, they offered me, that's a whole different story, but that's all by faith, they offered me free airtime. They said, we'll give you free airtime, we'll air you three times a week. We're talking worldwide television, the largest Christian network at the time. They said, we'll give you free airtime, you just have to promise you produce at a higher level. Basically, they were very kindly telling me it's not good enough yet. So they gave me a list of all the equipment I would need to get this thing going. And that was like, whoa, okay. That's, that's a lot of money. I think it was about $100,000 that we needed to get to build that set, to get the equipment going, to produce at that level. And I remember the Holy Spirit speaks to me again. He says, I want you to give away all your camera equipment again. I said, Again? Surely this is just a test. I thought it would be like Abraham and Isaac. I'd put it on the altar and go, oh, okay. Never mind. I still have my cameras. Thank God. Nope. And one by one, we gave out cameras. Some pastors didn't even use them. They just said, thank you. I got a camera. And then they never used them. And the Lord said, that's on them. I'll judge them for that. But you, I told to give. I said, okay. Giving out cameras. I was like the, the cameraman, just... Soundboards, microphones, video boards, computers, just giving it all out. And then I get a phone call from a man up in Northern California. And he, he used to call me Digadude. 
He can do that because uh, he pledged a lot, but you know, so you can call me whatever you want. Just keep sewing. <laughs> he calls me Diga Duty. He, he picks up the phone. Please don't call me that. He, he, <laughs> he calls me and he says, he says, Diga Dude. He goes, how big is your faith? I say, I gave a lot of stuff. I gave away a bunch of camera equipment. It's pretty high, I'd say, I hope. He said, then what am I about to tell you? I said, you're going to tell me that you're sending a check for what we need to buy this studio. He goes, oh, that is big faith. (laughs) And then he says, I'm sending the check. We're overnighting it. It'll be there tomorrow. Now, this is God's ministry. It's God's. Step by step, faith by faith, we, we, we walk in faith steps. If where you are doesn't require faith, you're not in the will of God. If where you are going doesn't require faith, you're not stepping into the will of God. As we move from faith to faith, we remember these principles Because if you can master the material, you can master yourself, you can subject the flesh in that way, God can trust you, not just with those riches, but with greater riches. You see, it's not about the resources themselves. It's not about the dollar amount, it's about the faith. What did God tell you to do? And so as we apply these biblical principles, we recognize that as we give We are not only causing God to move in the lives of others, but we're setting ourselves up now for God to bring others to support our vision. There's a vision God placed in you. There are dreams and there are hopes that were God-given, not of the flesh, but God-given. And we have to be stewards of resource. Do you realize this is one of the areas where people fight in the flesh? There's a few things you can't talk about and people get upset or people get upset. One of them is sin. Forget that these days. You get banned off of every social media platform. I might get banned on some social media platforms. They'll put me in Facebook jail for half the things I said tonight. Who cares? And, and, and so, so you can't talk about sin. You talk about eating healthy and taking care of your, your temple. Okay, that's a whole other thing. People start getting upset with you on that. You talk about politics. That'll divide a room real quick. Oh, but you talk about money. Don't talk about money even though it's in the Bible. Why? Because money is a test of the heart. And very few people pass this test. I'm not telling you anything tonight I haven't practiced myself or experienced myself. I can't tell you what to give. There are no magic amounts. I'm not going to tell you if you sow $77 in seven days, you'll have seven mansions. (laughs) And you'll be debt free for seven years. Well, you know, David, it's... 2023 and this year, I don't even know what any of that means. All I can tell you is it's simple faith. And so tonight I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and they're going to pass out envelopes all around this room. And you watching online, I want you to participate in the giving as well. You online can give using the URL that's being posted across the screen right now as you're watching. And then of course, we'll continue with the service. You hear who came for healing and deliverance. Believe God tonight. He's going to touch your life. I believe it. And again, remember, this is not tied to your healing and deliverance. This giving is just separate from that. We're talking now about faith and finances and growth and so forth. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what you should give, but I'm also asking you to scan that QR code on the envelope, and you'll see where we are as a ministry in terms of our fundraising for this event. These events cost resources. You notice that we didn't charge for parking. We didn't charge a registration fee. And I want to keep it that way because I never want to put a barrier between people and the gospel or the word of God. You never know. Some people might say, hey, I was going to come to the service, but oh, there was a registration fee. Forget it. We can hardly get unbelievers into church when it's free. Do we really think they're going to come if there's a registration fee? No, of course not. So we want to keep that free. And the way we do it is by sticking with the biblical model. Just freely giving, freely freely dispersing what God has imparted to us, and then allowing the people of God an opportunity to give out of their heart, to give out of their own free will, to hear from the Holy Spirit for themselves and say, Lord, what can I do?
to help this ministry. And I'm just gonna ask that you hear his voice. Give selflessly. Give sacrificially. I can't promise you that you're gonna be driving a Benz tomorrow. I can't promise you that you're gonna be debt-free in 30 days. What I can promise you is that the resources that come into this ministry will be used to further the kingdom of God. And that's all I'm gonna promise. Because that's all we need. Resources, resources, resources means expansion, expansion, expansion. You online can give online as well. And so as you're filling out those envelopes or giving via the QR code, those are a couple options you can take. Just remember that all of this is going to the ministry and it will help us expand our work. We want to see more people saved, more people healed, more people delivered, more people empowered. And as you're writing, you can make checks payable to David Hernandez Ministries. You can give using the QR code. That's probably the fastest way to give is the QR code. Everything that you give counts. There's no gift so small that it doesn't count. No gift so large that we won't know what to do with it. We've got big plans, big plans, and the resources haven't caught up to the vision yet. And I don't know if they ever will. I don't know if it's a good thing if they do. We want the vision to keep expanding. We want the kingdom to keep growing. We want the work to keep pushing back the darkness. And so you're giving tonight. You're saying, I want to participate. And I'm stepping out in faith, and I'm believing that God's going to do the same for me. I believe that God is going to provide for me. I believe that God's going to send others to support the vision that he gave to me. He'll do it. He will do it. And as you're filling that out, I'm just going to take a quick peek online where I can see many of you giving in the offering. I see Stephen. Thank you for your support. Ashley and Ivan and Deborah. Thank you, Monica and Joshua and Kevin and Carrie and Aaron and Brenda Lees and Diane and Cooper and Alona and Yelena. I see all of these gifts coming in from here in person and online. Thank you for your support. And now I want to pray. I want to pray that God would bless you. I know that's not why you're giving. I know you give because you love this ministry, because you want to see more souls saved. But I, want, I do, I want to pray for you. And when we pray, I don't want you to treat it like some ritualistic thing, like, oh, that's the offering prayer, and that's part of the service. No. I want you to join your faith with mine. And I want to believe with you that God will open the floodgates of heaven and that resources will be abundant for what he's called you to do in this season. I really believe he'll do it. So you're giving tonight. Just hold up your envelope like this. If you gave online, just hold up your hand like this. And I want you to agree with me as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every one of these who are giving tonight. I pray for those online who are pouring in their resources from around the world into this great work. And I pray, Father, that you would cause your people to see an increase in resources such as they've never seen before. We thank you that you're a big God. We thank you that you're you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. And I pray tonight, Lord, that your people would see increase, increase, increase. Prosper them, Lord, in all they do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. Let's pass those buckets or baskets or whatever we're using today. And you online, again, thank you for your support. I appreciate your giving. Everything counts. It all adds up. And I want you, as those buckets pass you, just to begin to stand to your feet all around the room. As the buckets pass you, go ahead and stand to your feet. Focus on the Lord. Jesus, we honor you. In just a few minutes, the tangible touch of the Holy Spirit's power is going to flow through this room. Many of you will feel like electricity come on your body. Some will feel like heat. Others will feel like waves. We even had reports of people feeling like waves. I can sense it even as I'm talking about it right now. Some people have even felt like a weight come on them. And when that happens, I do not want you to be afraid, nor do I want you to focus too much on it. Our focus remains on Jesus, not on what he does, but on who he is. And as we're worshiping, as we're praying, that power is going to begin to flow. Many will be healed. Many will be delivered. You do not have to wait for me to say your specific sickness. 
You do not have to wait for me to list your specific bondage. Jesus himself can see. The Bible says that many were, who were sick were brought unto him. And no matter their sickness or disease, he healed them all. Jesus is able. The Bible says that with a word, he cast out evil spirits. With a word. When God delivers you, it's not a long drawn out show. It's an instant display of authority. You don't have to fight or beg or plead. You're getting delivered tonight. It will happen in an instant. And whatever remains after that is all flesh, I promise you. It's not a fight for the Holy Spirit. He does not hide our freedom behind mysteries. It's as simple as calling upon his name and he'll do it. Lift your hands all across this room. Now is the moment just to begin to forget about everything around you. Focus on Jesus now. Please, just for the next minute or so, one more time, everybody praying out loud in the Holy Spirit, as boldly as you can now, as boldly as you can now. You watching online, praying in the Holy Ghost, as the power of God begins to stir this place. Send your robo bobo bo kented yento robo bo Jesus. Keep praying, keep praying. It's his power here, it's his power here. Then sings my Lift your hands and sing it, church. That's the power of God. How great thou art. How great thou art. Every voice lifted now, then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to How Sing it again, holy. 
simple words, church, sing it to him. looking at you as you sing it and he's listening. yours alone. Till I'm yours alone. Breathe upon me. Breathe upon me, Lord. Make my spirit known. Let me know to remember that only the presence of the Holy Spirit can satisfy the deepest longing of the human soul. 
Only the Holy Spirit's presence is like a wellspring of life, causing you to overflow with joy and peace and love. It's only the presence of the Holy Spirit that causes us to stand with boldness and faith and confidence in who God is. And while many complicate it, while many become distracted by the trappings of ministry and structure and marketing, it's important that we remember to turn our focus to Jesus. Remember that all he wants is one thing. He wants one thing from you. There's nothing that we can do that he can't do for himself. There's nothing that we could say that would impress him. There's nothing we could think of that God hasn't thought of himself already and even better so. Child of God, there's one thing, one thing, one thing he wants from you. And that's your love. Jesus has never held back from you. Don't hold back from him. Hands lifted all across this room, please. And as you sing this, I want you to remember that the Lord is attentive to what you're singing. I want you to remember that he is the audience for which we sing these songs. He's looking at you. He's listening to you. He's attentive to you. Sing it to him now. I love you. I love you. I love you. My Lord. Every voice lift it now. I love you. I love you. I love you. I come against every demonic power now. The light of his glory dissolve the darkness. The touch of his hand bring healing. the power. 
power of God. Out of her in Jesus' name. Come out of him in Jesus' name. Sickness go in Jesus' name. I rebuke depression in the name of Jesus. I rebuke anxiety in the name of Jesus. Every sickness, every disease, go, 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 go. Just worship him, just worship him. Don't wait for a song, people of God. Let the Holy Spirit begin to inspire praise and worship from deep within your being. For they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. From the floor to the balcony to the outside, the power of God is moving now.
It's the glory of God, church. That's the glory of God. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. your hands and sing it out. now church about if you heard it wave at me wave at me wave at me there is something supernatural that has opened up over this room every sickness every disease every bondage must go in the mighty name of Jesus every sickness and disease go eyes be healed ears be open injuries be healed knees and backs and skin be healed every voice lifted as we sing it again where you need healing. 
Place your hand on the part of your body where you need healing. If you need deliverance from OCD, from intrusive thoughts, from depression, from anxiety, from any form of mental illness, you need deliverance from a demonic stronghold, I want you to place your hands on your head right now. This is your moment. Do not wait for me to lay hands on you. I'm standing in the authority that God gave me right for this moment. I want you to receive that in the name of Jesus. Be healed. In the name of Jesus, be set free. In the name of Jesus, I come against every power of darkness and I command you to release your power now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, sickness be made whole. Somebody's eyes have just been healed. I give you glory, Jesus. Just keep praying. Pray, 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 pray. Somebody's eyes have just been healed. I thank you, Jesus. Miracles are happening all over the room. Uh, somebody with severe, severe mental torment of the mind. You're being delivered right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Someone else, a knee injury has just been healed. Somebody's ear, somebody's ear just popped open right now. Test that ear. Test that ear. Test that ear. Somebody's ear just opened right now. I give you the glory, Jesus. Can we just thank him for the miracles that are happening all over this room? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Skin disease, I rebuke it now. Paralysis, I rebuke it now. Every sickness of the bones must go. Every sickness of the liver, every sickness of the lungs, every sickness of the nerves, I rebuke it in the mighty name of Jesus. Someone else, uh, nightmares, severe nightmares over and over and over again. You've had insomnia as a result. The Holy Spirit told me to tell you, you're gonna sleep well tonight. The torment is done in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for every healing, every deliverance. I give you the praise. Keep laying hands on yourself. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. I command that healing virtue to flow right now to your body, right through this platform, right to your seat. To those people watching, I pray healing virtue would begin to flow even now. Flow even now. I give you the praise, Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. Now, you can't be shy about this because your testimony will be the difference for someone else's faith. If you believe you've been healed or delivered, I want you to wave at me like this. Look around the room, guys. Look at all these healings and deliverances. You see, you see, you see, for the Holy Spirit, it's easy. It's not a fight. It's not a fight for the Holy Spirit. If you believe you've been healed and you believe you've been delivered, Reuben, where do you want them? Come stand right here. You're going to testify and tell us about the miracle you just experienced. Come out of your seat right now. Come down from the balcony if you've been healed or delivered. You've tested yourself. And come stand right where they're waving you down. Look at these people coming now. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise as they approach? You believe you've been healed all the way down, all the way down. Keep praying, keep praying, church, keep praying. Jesus, we honor you. Can we just lift our hands and begin praying right now? Thank him for everything he's done. Thank him for everything he's done. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we give you glory. Look at these many who are coming to testify. Isn't that powerful? Tell them, church, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we the holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor as we lift our hands and worship as we bless your holy So online, if you're watching and you've been healed, I want you to write your testimony in the chat. 
If you've been delivered or you've been healed, write it down. The rest of you, please take your seats. How many are ready to hear what the Holy Spirit just did? Beautiful presence of the Lord here right now. You know that we talk about that weight that comes on the room. There was a moment just a few minutes ago. Did you guys sense that? Somebody said, oh, yeah. No, for real. I, I want to know if you truly you sense that. Just, just do a little wave, like a wave in glory. Isn't that phenomenal? Like, it's still in my mind. I can't, I can't quite grasp it. Like, I'm like, Lord, you truly are amazing that you would... You would manifest your presence in that way. I don't want you to take it for granted. Look, you don't come here to hear me preach. If you wanted to hear a teaching, you'd watch it on YouTube. If you wanted to share the salvation message with someone, you could show them the live stream. We're here for him. We're here for him. That beautiful manifestation of his presence. Ruben, what's happening here, my friend? David, I have Alona, who for 13 years now has had chest pain, went to the doctors, hasn't been diagnosed with anything, and up to recently, about four to five years now, have, has also dealt with panic attacks, anxiety. She said she's had this stronghold for years now, and she said today in service, the Lord touched her, and she said today for the first time, she has had no chest pain whatsoever. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want to talk to her just for a little bit. Look at the power took her all the way back there. Sergio, watch. Help her. When the Lord set you free, what was that like? Um, I just felt, well, my, I've had a lot of pain in my left arm as well, so a lot of the time my anxiety is associated with me fearing for a heart attack, but every time I've gone to the doctor, I'm always just told I have no physical cause for my pain, and it's just so crippling. Um, you know, many days I, you know, I'm just in so much fear, and, you know, we've known it's spiritual. We prayed many times, and um, I feel like I received deliverance, but then it just comes back again, and it's, like, not never permanent. But today, I just felt an overwhelming heat in my left arm. Um, and I just knew it was finished. I knew this was done. And I know that now, when you were saying that any symptom you might have is just flesh, but the deliverance is permanent, and it's just flesh and the enemy, reminding me, right, about what was, but and trying to distract me, right, from the victory and from God's power and... I just know it's, it's done. I believe it's done. Now, I don't know if you know, if I ever, if you ever had a chance to hear my testimony on this, did you know I used to have panic attacks? And do you know what my fear was? That I'd have a heart attack. And I would go in, she's Steve, all the time. Mike, my brother, he knows too. They would, they would be sitting there in the living room with me while I was panicking. And I would go in, and they would give me the EKG, yeah, they, the right? And, and, and you know, we as believers have to be aware that there's a spiritual attack that comes against us sometimes. And the way we step into freedom, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit sets us free. Walking in the truth keeps us free. Let me see your hand. Jesus. Let that same power you touched my life with come on hers. Peace, peace, peace. Oh, whoa, that's the power of God flowing through you. Just receive it. Just receive it. Don't worry. It's the presence of the Lord. Did, did, did we have a copy of any more copies? I saw Pam. Did you get one? Pam, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. I will give you one, and you'll have the first uh, official signed one. How's that? And I'll, well, other than Jess's. Okay. I want to give this to you as a gift, and, and, and that, that's my gift to you. Today marks the day of freedom. Read that first chapter. It's all about my panic attack. Bless you. Sergio, what happened here? Diga, this is Brittany. For the last week, she's been having a toothache. 
but the last three days it's been severe. She said as worship started, she said her, her teeth got numb and it was so bad she, had, she thought she had to get some gel for it, yeah. but it went away, it went numb and now the pain is completely gone. You know, the Bible says that he delights in every detail. I sense the power of God standing next to you. Yeah. He's, I tell people, it's not me, it's who's around me. That's the beauty of his presence. You know, the Bible says he delights in every detail of our lives. There's no miracle so big that God cannot do it. There's no miracle so small that God will not do it. And to us, we hear this, we go, okay, a toothache. But to her, that toothache was a problem, wasn't it? So tell us, as you're worshiping, what happens? Um, well, I was telling him too, even just sitting in the room next to my new friend I met, it started to, before we even had worship, it's, oh my goodness. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it started to go away. <laughs> oh Lord, we thank you for your touch. She, she's in a whole different place, guys. A whole different place. A whole different place. There's no manufacturing this. There's no man. I'll tell you, there's, it's all him. It's all him. Nobody knows that better than the men standing on the platform with me. Nobody knows that better than my closest friends. I'll tell you, it's all him. This, this is... This is something that is precious and beautiful, and we cannot take his power for granted in these days. This is not seen all the time. This is why we gather to see the power of God and to know him in greater depths. Just lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I have to know, Britton, you want to help Pat out? I'm going to need another usher up here with Patrick, please. I know we got enough testimony people, but I'll need another usher, but yeah. What are you feeling going through you right now? I don't, I don't, nothing. I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Lord, give it to these people too, in Jesus' name. Give it to these people too. Well, we'll need somebody to, to help her to her seat. Will you help her to her seat, sir? Thank you. Yeah, just help her out. You know, at some of our revivals, we used to have just chairs right on the side of the platform. They would just plop the people down there. What happened here, Britton? David, this is Angela. She said she would have this pain that would come and go anytime she would lift her hands her, behind her left shoulder. Oh, man. There would be this pain. And she said that during that moment where the worship shifted, that she felt the presence of God. She said she was shaking. She was overwhelmed by God's presence. And she said that the pain has left, it's completely gone. And can you describe the moment that the power of God came on you? Yes, I felt heat from the tip of my fingers all the way, descend down through my body and a tingling all in my hands and my arms. It's the glory of God here. It's his presence. Jesus said. It's gone and I can... I would, all night I've had such a hard time worshiping. It's been really uncomfortable. And then as soon as that atmosphere changed and I went up and it was gone, I don't feel it anymore. He's all over you. Just begin to pray in the spirit. It's a simple prayer in my life. struggling in your mind and you were sitting there watching these testimonies feeling left out like God had overlooked you but he's come to rescue you today to 
just lift your hands right there. Torment of the mind. I rebuke it now in Jesus' name. Stretch your hands toward this man and pray. Let the light of God fill him. Breathe upon him, precious Holy. There it is. There it is. Thanks, Lord. Sir, you're related to him? Is, is, that, is that your son? Would you stand up, put your hand on his head? Thank you, Jesus. Touch. Place your hand right on his head. There it is. Touch him, Lord. Break every bondage. I love you with an everlasting love, says the Spirit of God. I love you with an everlasting love. I have not forgotten you. I have not rejected you. I have not abandoned you to suffer in silence in the late night hours when you lie awake in your bed, struggling and tossing and turning for the memory of yesterday. God says, my power is able to set free. God says, my peace I give unto you. My joy overflowing I impart now. Receive that from my love. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty in the mighty name of Jesus. Be set free today. You know he'll leave the 99 for the 1. That doesn't mean he forgets about us. Because the 99 are all where they should be. He goes to get the one to bring them back to the 99. What's your name, brother? Matthew, look at me. He loves you with an everlasting love. He lo I know you've been through things. And I know the darkness is deep in your mind. And I know it feels like sometimes God is a million miles away. But he stopped the service for you, Matthew. He stopped the service for you. Remember who he called you to be. Remember the visions he gave you of the things you would do for him. Remember of that freedom. Receive it today. Lord, I thank you. Wow. Go rejoicing. Bless you. Help her out there, sir. What happened here, Reuben? Diga, hold on. Yes, sir. Some things are personal. I put the mic aside. Not everyone needs to hear everything. But God is touching this man. Hey, Britain. Get his contact information. You'll excuse me. This is important. This is important. Britain's going to get your contact. Brother, look at me. Brother, you're not alone. Colin, I'm going to put you on the spot. Where are you? Where's Colin? Colin, run down from the balcony. He's working sound right now. I want to show you what Jesus does. Yes, you, you go pray with him, Pastor Mike. 
and Pastor Mike, it'd be good too if you connected with them as well. We're not leaving. When you leave this place and you go back home, you're not going back by yourself. We're going to stay in touch. Colin, come here. Now, I want you, after Pastor Michael Dennis is done praying, holy, 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 holy. You know, you just have to go led by the Spirit. Just, just, just a moment. Pray, 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 pray. When someone is that desperate to come and yelling like that, 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 that's deep stuff, guys. That's deep. And you know, sometimes it's people are just trying to get attention. Not, that's not the case here. I, I can discern this man really, truly is hurting. He's hurting. Now, Pastor Mike, let me know when you're done praying. Keep praying for him, church. You online, pray for him too. You feel that? He's giving him a prophetic word right now. And we'll get your testimony in just a moment. You just enjoy the presence right there. You can soak in it a little longer. Now, Colin here. Matthew, look at Colin. This is Colin. Colin, tell him what things were like before Jesus set you free. Um, I used to see demonic things and hear demonic things. Um, and I just had a lot of depression, anxiety, just a lot of torment in my mind. And uh, Jesus set me free from all of that. Now listen. It was deep with him. Now, it's still a work. We, we're still working through things. You know, they're, they're from deliverance from demons, that's instant. Deliverance, deliverance from self, that's a journey. I'm still being delivered from self in many ways. And so we're, we're discipling Colin. We're working with him, but the voices are gone. The hallucinations are gone. The terrors are gone. And you're going you're gonna to know what that freedom is. I'm telling you that right now. Jesus set you free right now. I'm telling you. Every demonic power is done. Now it's a matter of walking in that freedom. And we're all connecting. Britain's got your contact. My brother's got your contact. Colin, you can go back to work. We'll we'll have... You're not going to go back and do this alone, okay? Now, Matthew, sit down in your seat as a new creation and rejoice in what God has done for you. And then um, bring him... Sir, if you would bring your son... After the service, sir, Michael, I'm, I'm talking to him. Sir, if you would bring your son to the service after, to the back afterwards for a few minutes, I'd like to chat with him privately some more, with you and him. What happened here, Ruben? Diga, I have Cynthia here. Two years ago, was diagnosed with an inflammatory breast disease, a very rare case. There's no cure. Mm-hmm. And she said she's had inflammation. She's had lumps on her chest two years now. During the line, she went to the back behind the black curtain, And then she came back outside crying because she said, I can verify the lumps are no longer there. Come on, church. Let's give Jesus a hand of praise. That's a creative miracle. They're gone. Yes, they are. They've told me that it's a rare breast disease. It's called granulomatous mastitis. And doctors have been trying so hard to find um, treatment for me. I've seen five doctors in total. And I mean, it just caused me a lot of pain. Um, The skin would get so red, so hot and so thin that it would cause um, open wounds and draining and bleeding and pain all over my body, caused me inflammation in my joints and caused me a lot of pain every day. And I've also, it was also a distraction in the service that my pain Um, wouldn't let me concentrate 
but I gave it all to God. And when you said, place your hand on your sickness, I placed it on my chest and I immediately felt something in my chest. <laughs> and I believe he healed me. I have an appointment June 1st to, for an ultrasound and I'm believing that he's healed me. Amen, and we'll believe right there with you. And to Jesus belongs all the glory and the honor. It's Jesus, it's Jesus. What happened here, my friend? Tiga, this is Stephanie. For 34 years, she dealt with her ears being muffled. So the sound was always muffled. She said during worship, all of a sudden, it went loud. She's been healed. You got to tell me about that moment. <laughs> um, I just remember as the worship team was singing, I thought, literally thought that somebody turned all the volume up in the place. And I was able to, to hear the instrument so clearly. I could hear my little sister singing. It was amazing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Just a beautiful presence. You feel that? My goodness, so strong here. Lord, we thank you. What else can we say, Jesus? I'll tell you this right now. Jesus and Jesus alone deserves the glory, the honor, and the praise. Jesus and Jesus alone deserves the glory, the honor, and the praise. Awaken. The prophetic stirrings to which I have called you. For I have shown you things by the Spirit that others miss. Awaken that prophetic anointing. Embrace it. Do not run from it. Do not say somebody else, Lord. Do not say I'm not qualified. Let him stir. As you praise, as you sing to him, as you worship, as you pray. There's a prophetic utterance. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Man? David, I have Annie here. She said for about half a year, it started with a black dot in the right side of her vision. And she said the past couple months, it's grown to a black circle in the right side of her vision. She could look over and see it, and it was obstructing her vision. She said tonight, it completely disappeared. She's looking for it, and she cannot see it. Her vision has been completely healed in the name of Jesus. And what happened when God did the miracle? I had this um, little dot start to in my right eyes, you know, from last Christmas. And then it turns to a black circle. Every time when I look this way, I can see the shadow of the black circle. I was intended to see the doctor, but not yet. But tonight, I'm healed. I don't need a doctor. Wow. I want every miracle that I see to be like the first one I saw. I'm so happy for what God has done for you, but what he's going to do for your family is going to be even greater. The work he's going to do in your family, now you have confidence. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Leave her there just a moment. Reuben, what happened here? Diga, I have James here. Ten years ago, was involved in a car accident, which caused him to have a herniated disc and lower back pain. Ever since then, 10 years, has had, ba has had pain in his lower back. It caused him to limp, walk funny because of the pain. He says he's done everything through pain. Today in service, he laid his hands on his back, and they opened his eyes, and then he tried to find the pain, and it was no longer there. The pain is completely gone. Beautiful miracle. 
And what was the presence of the Lord like around you as you experienced this miracle? Uh, I don't know. I just, you know, just numbness all over. And, you know, and just now I, I, you know, it was just weird because I I tried touching myself and, you know, see if I felt the pain. Because earlier I was, you know, usually I massage it and I I don't feel anything, you know. You sense that right now? Can you sense that? The presence of the Lord, can you sense that? What do you feel? I feel heat right now. It's his presence. This is the real deal, brother. He's calling you. He's calling you. Lord, I thank you that you've called this man for your purposes. Wow, I can feel that. There's like a literal... Gustavo, come here. Put your hand right here. Tell me what you feel. You feel that? It's, it's like, uh, what are you just feeling it like, sir? Forgive me, I'm like kind of getting lost in a moment here. Usually I'm not, I don't talk this slow and low. Can you describe it for them? I just feel loved. I just feel loved. so weighty church we thank God for everything he's done tonight and I know you don't want to go home but we have to prep for tomorrow now obviously I think we, we know now that we have to get here early if we want to get a seat I, I do not want you to miss what the Lord will do tomorrow you watching online you haven't come to one of these you come in during worship, it's already too late. Come early. Line up if you have to. I promise you, it'll be worth it. I know that tomorrow, there's going to be a great demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power that's even greater than what we've seen here tonight. We're going to believe for healing tomorrow, just like we did tonight. We're going to believe for deliverance, just like we did tonight. We're going to believe for the move of the Holy Spirit to touch your life. Tomorrow, I will not be ministering a salvation message. I'll be talking to the believer. Can we just stand all across this room? I'm going to minister tomorrow on Holy Spirit encounters. And it's my prayer that every single one of you come into a deeper revelation of the power and the presence that's available on your life. And I pray tomorrow that you would encounter the Holy Spirit's presence like you've never encountered him before. We're going deeper tomorrow night. Amen. Lift your hands. Make this your prayer. Show us your glory. Show us your glory.